So um, this is not part of my two minutes, Nicole. I just have to say this. In this uh, time of threat of the environment, uh, there's also an ongoing threat to women's rights. And I'm just really glad that we have so many women being honored tonight. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. Tom will make you an honorary woman tonight. Thank you. So it's not often that you get the call up from a former state senator to present an award on his behalf, but that is what I was asked to do tonight uh, because Tom Hayden couldn't join us. I was honored when Lisa asked me to step in for him. Um, it helps that I've known Lisa longer than anyone in this room other than her family, her parents and siblings. Um, I think it's true, unless she has a high school friend here. Any high school friends? Okay, so, sorry, Kai, I've got, I've got them beat, other than your parents. Um, I actually met her when I was 16 years old. We were, it, it's actually a funny story, but I'll spare you the details. Uh, it's much longer than two minutes will allow, but suffice to say, I met her on a Greyhound bus with 40 other high school students from four western states bound for the United Nations in New York City. I had no idea that... 32 years later, our paths would end up being so aligned and that we would be working together in the, same, uh, in the same movement that we are. She was then, as she is now, a passionate human being with deep appreciation for the world around her, immense love for friends and family, and an immeasurable commitment to campaigning and leading. For those of you that haven't had the pleasure of meeting Lisa yet, she will find you, I'm sure. She is the director and co-founder of Climate Parents, a national organization focused on mobilizing parents and families for clean energy and climate solutions. She's been a campaigner in the labor, environmental, and environmental justice movements in California for 25 years, most recently serving as California director of the Blue-Green Alliance and the former, uh, the former Apollo Alliance. Her father, John, would want you to know that her commitment to protect the environment actually started in first grade which is not surprising to me because I, I have no doubt that it started very young. Lisa has run legislative and electoral campaigns with the National AFL-CIO and the South Bay AFL-CIO Labor Council and global justice campaigns with the Congress of South African Trade Unions in Johannesburg. She has worked with Greenpeace to fight toxic facilities in low-income communities and served as a committee consultant to the California Senate Natural Resources Committee under, of course, Tom Hayden. Lisa is Latina and bilingual and is committed to building a movement of parents and families for climate action that is ethically and geographically, ethnically, excuse me, and geographically diverse. And now I want to read a message from Tom Hayden. I'm sure as any of you would know Tom, uh, keeping to two minutes would be a challenge, but I can tell you that he did, except that I'm probably running a little over, so I'm going to read his message. To Sarah, Susan, and all my friends here tonight, to the great Annie Nodoff, to the other Lisa, the amazing Lisa Jackson, and of course to my friend and partner of many years, Lisa Oyos, I am with you in spirit, but apologize for my physical absence on this great night. I remember the many campaigns for justice that are leading to our shared, clim cl excuse me, our shared goal of climate justice as endorsed by Pope Francis and many leaders gathering in December for the United Nations Climate Talks. One of the thousands of warriors for justice and a safe environment who I have been privileged to know, Lisa, whom you are honoring tonight. She is a special one, a true guardian angel sent to save our precious world. She is also special because she comes from the organizing tradition on which the whole world depends. She has evolved and matured over the years. I might have been her boss and mentor, but she has taught me everything about the immigrants' rights movement and made me speak in broken Spanish to massive rallies around the world. I count on her and many in her generation I have been fortunate to know to take leadership in the climate change movement toward the goal of a California that is a renewable energy model to the country and to the world. I love you, Lisa. That's Tom speaking, but I love you too. <laughs> and my wife sends her love, and we hope to be arm in arm for many years ahead. Tom Hayden. Lisa, get on up here. Thank you so much to my dear friend Susan and to Tom and Abstentia. And as, as Susan said, Tom is here in spirit, and I'll say more about him in a, in a minute. 
I'm really thankful to CLCV for this award and to be receiving it alongside such amazing and inspiring leaders as Annie Nodoff and Lisa Jackson. I want to also acknowledge my wonderful family who teach me so much. My husband, J.B. Tanko, our boys, Kai and Cruz, my parents, John and Sylvia, and my father and siblings-in-law, Lee, Kevin, and Michelle, and uh, my colleague, John Friedrich of Climate Parents, my partner in crime. When Sarah called to tell me about this award, I was really excited to get to address this particular gathering that comes together every year and is so full of power, energy, and insight. It's just a, an amazing group that CLCB convenes. There are two things I want to touch on tonight. One is I want to share a little more about climate parents. And the other is I want to offer up an idea that this award actually inspired. Um, and I'll promise to volunteer to make it happen because ideas are one thing and actions another. So first on climate parents. How many of you are parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles? Raise your hand. Most people. We're a powerful and large constituency. Back in 2008 when Kai was only three and Cruzy was just four months, I heard a story on NPR about what the world would look like in the year 2035 if we didn't do enough to cut carbon pollution. It was mostly about systems collapse, food systems, water systems, mass displacement. I did the math and realized that in the year 2035, my boys are only going to be in their late 20s. It was a lightning bolt moment that helped me kind of realize that if all parents really understood this threat, They'd want to get involved in mobilizing for solutions because along with loving our kids, it's our core responsibility to keep them safe. Since launching Climate Parents two years ago, we've been organizing in multiple states to expand clean energy policies, advance Obama's clean power plan, um, fight dirty energy like coal export infrastructure. We've also worked in some red states to stop conservative Tea Party-esque politicians from stopping kids from learning climate science. <laughs> and here in California, we're mobilizing to support the governor's executive order, of course, and working uh, in support of 350, SB 350, teaming up with lots of you who are here tonight, including another ally in the parent space called Mom's Clean Air Force, and the PTA is actually getting involved, the California PTA. So... Before sharing that idea I mentioned, I need to set a little bit of context. Everything that's been said tonight about California being a clean energy leader is, of course, true and inspiring. Compared to most other places in the world, we're A students. But keeping in mind how dire the climate crisis is, we're all aware. We need to keep leveraging our power, our influence, and our technologies to help scale clean energy before our borders. Because as lots of us, I think, break into sweats about, globally, there are five times more fossil fuels in the ground, in reserves, than we can afford to burn uh, in order to stay below the two degrees Celsius of global temperature rise that scientists say we must if we want to avoid the very worst impacts of climate change, which if you really delve into, look a lot like the movie Blade Runner. With the exception of Apple Computer, which is leading the way, the world's most powerful and wealthy multinationals are flexing all the muscle, political, Congress, money-giving muscle they have to extract and burn everything they can. And even President Obama, who's been leading on climate diligently for the last few years, just took a step backwards in the last week by granting Shell a permit to drill in the Arctic in a reserve that climate scientists say we have no business touching if we want to protect our climate. And those of us who continuously battle the Western States Petroleum Association know mobilizing against the fossil fuel industry is like playing an endless game of whack-a-mole. So we have to be at the top of our game in the climate movement. We're a team, and if you look around this room, we're looking at all our teammates. I recently read something that Nelson Mandela said that connects to California, and it's kind of what gave me the idea I'm about to share. He was reflecting on John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath. Here's what he said about that. When I closed that book, I was a different man. It enriched my powers of thinking, my discipline, and my relationships. 
Reading those words from Mandela made me think a lot about our relationships here, that an important part of being on top of our game is better understanding our own respective across sectors, priorities, and, and, uh, and, yeah, I lost that, uh, of our stakeholder groups, not just as it overlaps in relationship to bills or policy that's right in front of us, not just where our little Venn diagrams overlap, but more holistically, so if I'm a labor activist or an EJ activist or an Air Resources Board policy analyst or a clean tech innovator or a parent working on clean energy, what gets me up in the morning? I thought it was funny Lisa talked about what gets her up in the morning. Why do I devote my life to this work? Why do we? So I want to volunteer to help put together one day a cross-constituency meeting that would bring together labor, enviros, EJ, clean energy, business, and other allies. It would be on a Friday or in October, or after session's over, when there's a bit more breathing room, so you guys have to come. And we'd spend half a day doing a deeper dive and getting to know each other's issues and our vision better. And then for the second part of the day, we'd bring in some of our most forward-thinking and visionary experts on climate and clean energy and climate resilience. The Union of Concerned Scientists is into this idea. Adrian's already thinking of folks. And this is where our visioning part comes in. Last month, Hawaii announced plans to get to 100% clean energy by 2045. Despite, woo, despite the fact that we're a much bigger economy, Stanford energy experts say that we could get there too, maybe even sooner. How could we accomplish that? And how could we do so in a way that builds equity, equality, jobs and the environmental sustainability on the front end. Like we have the collective intelligence to figure that out at the design phase. It would, be, it would be great to strategize about that together. And regarding climate resilience, the drought's already upon us. What are the next 30 years where our little guys are growing up? What do they look like? And how do we plan for drought, sea level rise, uh, wildfires, and all those things that are already happening now? Our state agencies are working on it, but how do we cross-sectorally bring our multiple intelligences to bear on how we protect the most vulnerable and how we expand equity and jobs? So after all that day-long thing, um, I envision a super fun happy hour. <laughs> it's just one day to get our voices, go, you know, f our juices flowing, and we'll see what happens from there. But that's what I commit to, that one day. I know most of you have heard of TED Talks in... Um, in honor of Tom, I want to call this whole idea a Tom talk. Tom's a cross-cutting, empathic warrior in the civil rights, anti-war, and environmental movement. So I want to end with a toast to Tom that we're going to capture on video and send to him as he recovers from his stroke. We'll also have these get well cards. Oh, man, who's got that basket? That basket is going to be by the bar, and there's five beautiful Get Well cards and extra paper, so please sign one right there. And, um, okay, so thank you, baby. So good. That's a, an uh, addition to your allowance this week. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. We're going to toast Tom. So I'm going to say uh, Tom Hayden, and you'll say Viva.